today at the National Press Club, the award-winning Australian author Richard Flanagan. Born in Tasmania, he is now published in 42 countries and in 2014 took out the Man Booker Prize for his novel The Narrow Road to the Deep North. Richard Flanagan with today's National Press Club address. Well, hello and welcome to the National Press Club in Canberra for today's Westpac Address. I'm Misha Schubert, one of the Vice Presidents and Directors of the Club, and it's my privilege to chair today's event with the acclaimed Australian author Richard Flanagan. If you're a social media person, as distinct perhaps from an anti-social social media person, you might wish to join our conversation online during today's session using the hashtag NPC or our Twitter handle at Press Club Aust, A-U-S-T on the end. Or you might wish to just be old school and drink in the detail of Richard's address with undiluted concentration. How about that for a radical thought? Either way, I'm sure it'll be terrific. But first, let's begin properly. I acknowledge the traditional owners, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who have lived this country and loved this country through the vastness of time. I pay my respects to your old people, to your elders and ancestors who are the safe keepers of the oldest living cultures on the planet. For this is the very bedrock of our unique Australian identity in the world and a source of shared pride for us all as Australians. What a treat it is today to welcome to the National Press Club one of Australia's finest writers, Richard Flanagan. Richard was born in Longford, Tasmania in 1961. His novels have accrued <coughs> numerous honours and are published in 42 countries. They include The Death of a River Guide, Sound, The Sound of One Hand Clapping, Gould's Book of Fish, The Unknown Terrorist and Wanting. And of course he won the Man Booker Prize for The Narrow Road to the Deep North in 2014, drawing on his father's experiences as a slave labourer and prisoner of war on the Thai Burma Railway. His most recent novel, First Person, took inspiration from him being drafted, I think, 30 years ago to work on an autobiography of Australia's greatest con man, John Friedrich, which Richard Ghost wrote in six weeks to make money to write his first novel. Friedrich killed himself in the middle of the book's writing and it was published, published posthumously, prompting Simon Catterson to once describe it as, quote, one of the least reliable but most fascinating memoirs in the annals of Australian publishing. <laughs> Today we've handed Richard a blank page and asked him to share a few thoughts on things that have been on his mind of late. They include the rise of authoritarianism, Australian myths and Indigenous Australia's call for constitutional recognition. So please join me in welcoming to the National Press Club, Richard Flanagan. Um, thank you very much, Misha, and, uh, and thank you all for coming here. Um, and thank you for those very kind uh, alternative facts about me. Um, there is, I must admit, as Sarah Huckabee Sanders last year observed of Donald Trump retweeting a neo-Nazi post, truth in it. Uh, I don't need, though, to tell journalists who routinely profile politicians that any truthful biography is finally a form of selective lying. I can confirm one detail. I am a novelist, a difficult calling in a country whose national hero was for many years a celebrity TV gardener, which perhaps explains why Barnaby Joyce wanted his photo taken with him and not, say, David Maloof. I told a friend the other day I was to be speaking here in Canberra and she told me a joke. A man has doubled over at the front of Parliament House, throwing up. A stranger comes up and puts an arm around the vomiting man. I know how you feel, the stranger says. I didn't think it was a bad joke. <laughs> but, but it did feel familiar and I, I went home. And I found a variation of it in Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting, set in communist Czechoslovakia in the dark years following the Prague Spring. In Kundera's version, the two men are standing in Wenceslas Square. Both jokes are about failing regimes that have lost the essential moral legitimacy governments need to govern. We don't have to like or agree with a government but still accept it has the right to make decisions in our name. Until, that is, 
We don't. And it occurred to me in both jokes, it's not just those in immediate power, but a whole system that is beginning to lose its moral legitimacy. As a young man, I was studying in England, which I didn't much enjoy, and I spent most of my time in Yugoslavia, which I enjoyed very much. Yugoslavia was then a communist dictatorship, but it occupied a curious place, halfway between the Soviet and capitalist system. Yugoslavs were a well-educated, cultured people, but the system, like that of the Czechs, lost its moral legitimacy in the wake of Tito's death in the mid-80s. A credit crisis became a full-blown economic and then political crisis. Opportunistic politicians, devoid of solutions to the nation's problems, instead pitched neighbour against neighbour. And suddenly, nothing held. I witnessed a country slide into inexplicable nationalisms and ethnic hatreds, and in the space of a very short time, into genocidal madness. It made me realise at a young age that the veneer of civilised societies is very thin, a fragile thing that, once broken, brings forth monsters. Czechoslovakia took a different route. After the final toppling of the system with the Velvet Revolution in 1989, the revolution's leader, Václav Havel, wrote presciently of how the West should not gloat over the fall of the old Soviet states. Eastern Europe had been, he observed, simply a twisted mirror reflecting back a distortive image of what might come to prevail in the West. If the West only gloated and did not learn from what the image portended of its future, it too might find itself one day facing a similar existential crisis. In the heady 1990s, Havel's warnings sounded absurd and overwrought, and yet it came to pass exactly as Havel warned. The West did gloat, declaring the end of history, and in its triumphalism, dangerous new forces were allowed to fester unchecked, their scale and threat only becoming fully apparent in the last few years. Now, in Russia, in Turkey, in Poland, in Hungary, and the Czech Republic even, we see the rise of the strongman leader, some like Putin, already effectively dictators, others like Erdogan and Orban, well on the way. In Slovakia, a leading journalist was recently murdered after exposing links between leading Slovakian politicians and the Italian Mafia. There are no saviours of democracy on the horizon. Rather, around the world, we see a new authoritarianism that is always anti-democratic in practice, populist in appeal, nationalist in sentiment, fascist in sympathy, criminal in disposition, tending to spew a poisonous rhetoric aimed against refugees, Muslims and, increasingly, Jews hostile to the truth and those who speak it, most particularly journalists, to the point, more and more often, of murder. And yet, this new authoritarianism is resonant for so many people, acting as it does as a justification for rule by a few wealthy oligarchs and corporations, and as an explanation for the growing immiseration of the many around the world. In Australia, though, we feel ourselves, as ever, a long way away. We feel we are somehow immune from these currents. After all, we've had routine forays into populism from the mid-1990s with the likes of Hansenism without it ever threatening our democracy. Our politics may be dreadful, a black comedy pregnant with collapse, its actors exhausted, without imagination or courage or principle, 
solely obsessed, it would seem, with pillaging the tawdry jewels of office and fleeing into distant sinecures as ambassadors or high commissioners or with paid up Chinese board posts while outside the city burns. But it is all very far from a dictatorship. And yet, our society grows increasingly more unequal, more disenfranchised, angrier, more fearful. Even in my hometown of Hobart, as snow settles on the mountain, there is the deeply shameful spectacle of a tent village of the homeless, the numbers of which increase daily. We sense the rightful discontent of the growing numbers locked out from a future from hope. Instead of public debate, scapegoats are offered up. The boat person, the queue jumper, the Muslim, a xenophobia both parties have been guilty of playing on for electoral benefit for two decades. Instead of new ideas and new visions, we are made wallow in threadbare absurdities and convenient fictions. Australia Day, the world's most livable cities, secure borders. Our institutions are frayed. Our polity is discredited and almost daily discredits itself further. The many problems that confront us from housing to infrastructure to climate change are routinely evaded. Our screens are filled with a preening peloton of potential leaders, but nowhere is there to be found leadership. Holdelin, the great 19th century poet, wrote of the mysterious yearning toward the chasm that can overtake nations. Increasingly, one can sense that yearning in the heated rhetoric of some Australian politicians and commentators. And that yearning can overtake Australia as easily as it has so many other countries, damaging our democracy, our freedoms, our values. Politics, which ought to have as its highest calling the task of holding society together, of keeping us away from Holderland's chasm, has retreated to repeating divisive myths that have no foundation in the truth of what we are as a nation, and so finally contribute only to the forces that could yet destroy us, or worse yet, openly stoking needless fear, as some do, and with the refugee and migrant issue, a xenophobia for short-term electoral advantage. The consequence is a time bomb which simply needs as a detonator what every other country has had, and we have not, hard times. But hard times inevitably must return and when they do, what defence will we have should a populist movement that trades on the established scapegoats arise? An authoritarian party with a charismatic leader that uses the poison with which the old myths are increasingly pregnant to deliver itself power. The challenge that faces us, the grave and terrifying challenge, is to transform ourselves as a people. This fundamental challenge is not policy, it is not franking credits, nor is it tax giveaways or rail links, necessary or not as these things may be. It is to realise that, we, that if we don't create for ourselves a liberating vision founded of, in the full truth of who we are as a people, we will find ourselves in a moment of crisis, suddenly entrapped in a new authoritarianism, wearing the motley of all the old lies. For we are a people of astonishing perversity. We are an ancient country that insists on thinking itself new. We are a modern nation that insists our recent arrangements are so time-honoured that none of them can ever be changed. We are a complex country that insists on being simple-minded, and we regard simplicity as a national virtue, and when coupled with language unimpeded by the necessity for thought, 
is regarded as strong character, which may explain Scott Morrison, but little else. And for the last two decades, we have doubled down and doubled down again on old myths that have become more dangerous the longer we allow them to go unchallenged. Six days from now, on the eve of Anzac Day, Prime Minister Turnbull will launch a war memorial come museum in France. Costing an extraordinary $100 million, the Monash Centre is reportedly the most expensive museum built in France for many years. It will honour those Australians who so tragically lost their lives on the Western Front in World War I and more generally the 62,000 Australians who died in World War I. Would that someone might whisper into the Prime Minister's ear the last line of Wilfred Owen's poem about those same fatal trenches. My friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie Dolce et decorum est, pro patria mori. Owen's last Latin phrase, the old lies, he puts it, is from the Roman poet Horace. It is sweet and fitting to die for one's country. Except the Australians didn't even die for Australia. They died for Britain, for their empire not our country. A double lie then, a lie within a lie. But as Tony Abbott asked when, as Prime Minister, he announced the building of the museum, what was the alternative in Britain's time of need? Well, we might answer, staying home for one thing and not dying in other people's wars. <coughs> And yet the horrific suffering of so many Australians for distant empires has, ha has now become not a terrible warning, not a salient story of the blood sacrifice that must be paid by nations lacking in independence, not the unhappy beginning of an unbroken habit, but bizarrely the purpur purported origin story of us as an independent people. The growing state-funded cult of Anzac will see $1.1 billion spent by the Australian Government on war memorials between 2014 and 2028. Those who lost their lives deserve honour. And I know from my father's experience how meaningful that can be but when veterans struggle for recognition and support for war-related suffering, you begin to wonder what justifies this particular expense, this growing militarisation of national memory, or, to be more precise, a forgetting of anything other than an official version of war as the official version of our country's history, establishing dying in other people's wars as our foundation story. And so the Monash Centre, for all its good intentions, for all the honour it does the dead, is at its heart a centre for forgetting. It leads us to forget that the 62,000 young men who died in World War I died in the service of one distant empire fighting other distant empires. It leads us to forget that not one of those deaths it commemorates was necessary, not 62,000 not even one. Lest we forget, we will all chant next week, as we have all chanted for a century now. And yet it is as if all that chanting only ensures we remember nothing. If we remembered, would we, one, would we 100 years later, still allow our young men to be sent off to kill or be killed in distant conflicts, defending yet again not our country, but another distant empire, as we have in Iraq and Afghanistan. If all that chanting simply reinforces such forgetting, 
then what hope have we now in negotiating some independent, safe path for our country between the growing tension of another empire, the American, and the rising new empire of the Chinese? Because instead of learning from the tragedies of our past, we are ensuring that we will learn nothing. The forgetting even extends to the horrific suffering of war. The Prime Minister, who will, no doubt, speak genuinely and sincerely and movingly of the torn bodies and broken lives of the Australians who fell in France, is also the same Prime Minister who wants to see the Australian arms industry become one of the world's top ten defence exporters, seeking to boost exports to several countries, including what was described as the rapidly growing markets in, the Asia, in Asia and the Middle East, in particular the United Arab Emirates, a country accused of war crimes in Yemen. Anzac Day, which is a very important day for my family, was always a day to remember all my father's mates who didn't make it home. But it was also a moment to ponder the horror of war more generally. But of late, Anzac Day has become enshrouded in cant and entangled in dangerous myth. If this seems overstated, ponder the bigoted bile that attended Yasmin Abdel Magid's tweet last Anzac Day in which she posted, lest we forget Manus, Nauru, Syria, Palestine. I read that as a plea for compassion drawing on the memory of a national trauma. Most refugees on Manus and Nauru are fleeing war. The terrible war in Syria has left half a million dead and over 11 million people exiled internally and externally. And the Palestinians, whatever position one takes, suffer greatly from ongoing conflict. And yet, as the attacks on Abdel Majid showed, some were seeking to transform Anzac Day into a stalking horse for racism, misogyny, anti-Islamic sentiment. In other words, for hate, for intolerance, for bigotry, for all those very forces that create war. The great disrespect to Anzac Day wasn't the original tweet, but the perverted attacks made on it in, of all things, the name of the dead. Those who think they honour Anzac Day by forgetting contemporary victims of war only serve to make a tragic mockery of all that that day should be. We should, of course, question these things more. We could even go so far as to ask why, if we were actually genuine about remembering patriots who have died for this country, why we would not first spend $100 million on a museum honouring the at least 65,000 estimated Indigenous dead who so tragically lost their lives defending their country here in Australia in the frontier wars of the 19th century? Why is there nowhere in Australia telling the story of the massacres, the dispossession, the courageous resistance of these patriots? The figure of 65,000, I should add, is one arrived at by two academics at the University of Queensland and applies only to Indigenous deaths in that state. If their methodology is correct, the numbers for the Indigenous fall and nationally must be extraordinarily large. As one prominent commentator noted, individually and collectively, it was sacrifice on a stupendous scale. We should be a nation of memory, the commentator went on, not just of memorials, for these are our foundation stories. They should be as important to us as the ride of Paul Revere or the last stand of King Harold at Hastings 
or the incarceration of Mandela might be to others. The prominent commentator was Tony Abbott, announcing the French Museum, speaking of the dead of World War I. And yet, how can his argument be said not to also hold for the Indigenous dead? After all, Sir John Monash became the great military leader he was, in spite of considerable prejudice, and so too Pemulwuy and Jandamara. Of course, such a reasonable and necessary proposal as a museum for the Indigenous fallen would at first be greeted with ridicule and contempt, because in the deepest, most fundamental way, we are not free of the colonial past. Freedom exists in the shadow of memory. For Australia to find out what freedom means, it has to face up to the truth of its past. And it's time we decided to accept what we are and where we come from, because only in that truth can we finally be free as a people. Sixty years ago, the scientific consensus was that Indigenous Australians had been in Australia for only 6,000 years. But through a series of breathtaking discoveries, science has confirmed what Indigenous people always knew, that they have been here for at least 60,000 years. <coughs> it makes you wonder if the $500 million earmarked for renovating the Australian War Memorial would not be more wisely spent on a world-class national Indigenous museum that honours a past unparalleled in human history. Surely, you might think, when we have the oldest continuous civilisation on earth, is not such a major institution central to our understanding of ourselves as a people? Is it not necessary? Is it not fundamental to us as a nation? It is, after all, extraordinary and beyond a disgrace that there is in the 21st century no museum telling that extraordinary story, so that all Australians might know it, so that the world might share in it, and so that we might learn something of the struggle and achievement, the culture and unique civilisations that were and are Indigenous Australia. We have turned our back on this profound truth again and again because to acknowledge it is also to acknowledge the other great truth of Australia, that the prosperity of contemporary Australia was built on the destruction of countless Indigenous lives and with them dreamings, songlines, languages, alternative ways of comprehending not only our extraordinary country but the very cosmos. And yet, if we were to have the courage and largeness to acknowledge as a nation both truths about our past, we would discover a third truth, an extraordinary and liberating truth for all Australians' future about who we are and where we might go. We would discover that though this land and its people were colonised, a 60,000-year-old civilisation is not so easily snuffed out. And the new people who came to Australia in their dealings with black Australia were also indigenised. And in the, ma the mash-up, indigenous values of land, of country, of time, of family, of space and story became strong also among non-Indigenous Australians. Indigenous ways, forms, understandings permeated our mentality and everything from Australian rules football to our sense of humour. As much as there was a process of colonisation, there was also this history of indigenisation, a frequently repressed, often violent process in which a white underclass took on many black ways of living and sometimes more fundamentally thinking and feeling 
in which may be traced continuities that extend back into deep time. And if we were to pursue this idea, we would discover that we are not Europeans, nor are we Asians, that we are not a new country, that we are, in the first instance, a society that begins in deep time. That is the bedrock of our civilisation as Australians. That is our birthright. And if we would accept it rather than spurn it, we might discover so many new possibilities for ourselves as a people. My own island is a good example of both processes. There took place there what was described, not by a contemporary left-wing academic, but an 1830s Van Demonian Attorney General as a war of extermination. A terrible war of which less than 100 people survived from whom today's 25,000 strong Palawa people are descended. To this day, Tasmanian society is shaped by the tragedy of a land where the English, as a ship's captain's wife, Rosalie O'Hare, confided in her diary in 1828, consider the massacre of these people as an honour. But it was, for a critical time, also a land where many ex-convicts, to quote a contemporary witness, dress in kangaroo skins without linen and wear sandals made of seal skins. They smell like foxes. They live in bark huts like the natives, not cultivating anything but living entirely on kangaroos, emus and porcupines. In coming to understand how to live in this strange new world, they took on Aboriginal partners, friends, ways of life and thinking. No less an authority than John West, the first editor of the Sydney Morning Herald, wrote in 1856 that the Vandemonians living outside of the two major settlements had a way of life resembling that of the Aborigines. It was a messy, often brutal, inescapably human response to extraordinary times and places out of which emerged a new people. It was a revolution of sense and sensibility so extraordinary it is even now hard to fully compass its liberating dimensions. And it is also finally a history of hope for us all. For it shows we are not dispossessed Europeans, but a muddy wash of peoples made anew in the meeting of pre-industrial, pre-modern European culture with a remarkable indigenous culture. George Orwell once said that the hardest thing to see is what is in front of your face. This is what is in front of ours. We became our own people. We pretend that our national identity is a fixed, frozen thing, but Australia is a molten idea. We have only begun to think of ourselves as Australians within living memory. There was no legal concept of an Australian citizen until 1948. Twenty years later, the Australian population was still divided into the following categories by the ABS in its official yearbook, British born in Australia, British born overseas and foreign. Indigenous Australia wasn't even recorded as a general category. But that same Indigenous Australia has, after great thought and wide discussion, asked in the Uluru Statement that it be heard and that one of the forms this should take as an advisory body to Parliament a body that would be recognised in the Constitution. What a gift this is that we give you, Gullaroy Yanapingu has said, if you choose to accept us in a meaningful way. The gift we're being offered is vast. The patrimony of 60,000 years and with it the possibilities for the future that it opens up to us. We can choose to have our beginning and our centre in Indigenous culture. 
or we can choose to walk away into a misty world of lies and evasions pregnant with the possibility of future catastrophe. But the gift needs honouring in what Yanapingu calls a meaningful way. It needs honouring with institutions, with monuments, with this profound history being made central in our account of ourselves, and above all, with what the Indigenous, with what the indigenous people have asked for repeatedly, constitutional recognition in truth, we can no longer go forward without addressing this matter. We cannot hope to be a republic if this is not at the republic's core, because otherwise we're only repeating the error of the colonialists and the federationists before us. At a moment when democracy is imperiled around the world, we have been offered the extraordinary possibility of completing our democracy. That saying these things might be deemed unreasonable or shrill or far-fetched should remind us all of how intolerable the situation remains in this country for Indigenous people. How unbearable it must be for Indigenous people to know that their patrimony, their 60 millennia old culture, which they are willing to share, which has shaped and continues to shape much of what is best in us as a people, will, however, continue to be treated as marginal and they, again, humiliated. Even if you have no respect for Indigenous Australia, you should care for the future of your country. And now, more than ever, we need ways of bringing us together, not as, for example, Australia Day presently does by dividing us. We need a large and open vision of who we are, sustained in truth, not myths that encourage dangerous illusions. I know these are large ideas, but perhaps they are the ideas for these times. None of these things are easy. None would be arrived at quickly, but the alternative is worse. The alternative is the slow collapse. It is the many cracks which are already appearing, the inequality, the grounds for an authoritarian revolt for a hopelessly divided country. It is the yearning for the chasm overwhelming us. Definitions belong to the definer not the defined. For 20 years, Australians lived with the definition that they were selfish, xenophobic, self-interested, and incapable of being roused on larger issues. But the marriage equality debate proved it was not so. Since the marriage equality vote, it's clear that Australians are not the mean and pinched people. We had been persuaded and bluffed for so many years that we were. We are not small-minded bigots. We are, as it turns out, people who care, people who feel and who think. Australia is not a fixed entity, a collection of outdated bigotries and reactionary credos, but rather the invitation to dream and this country, our country, belongs to its dreamers. And if after over 20 years of Groundhog Day, we are finally ready to once more go forward as a people, it's time our dreamers were brought in from the cold and with them Gulleroy Yanapingo's great gift of the Australian dreaming. Thank you for listening to me. Um, so many big ideas and uh, so powerfully expressed, it's hard to know quite where to begin for question time. Um, 
there will be a number of questions from Working Press and from the floor, but I wondered, Richard, if I could uh, ask you to begin question time by reflecting on one of the many themes you drew out in your address about um, the anger within those, those societies that are fracturing and whether you think we have somehow lost or are losing the art of disagreeing agreeably. Um, oh, thank you, Misha. Um, I do think that, that the whole uh, problem with social media and the net is that it, it just encourages um, hostility and anger. That's what's rewarded on the internet. I think one of the founders of Twitter said the problem with social media is that if you were driving past um, a car smash, you would turn your head for a moment to look at the horror of it the internet reads that as you wishing always to look at car smashes. Um, it is in the nature of the form that it demands ever angrier, more polarised responses. And now we, we know that um, uh, the major political forces are employing um, uh, companies like Cambridge Analytica to actually manipulate that anger, to manipulate that polarisation even further. Now, I think in the words of uh, one of the Cambridge Analytica people, we can now play on your deepest fears. So uh, I think um, I, I very much believe in the need for civility and discussion, and I think um, ideas should be respected and treated respectfully uh, because most people come to them with goodwill. Our first question from the journalist is from Melissa Clark. Melissa Clark from ABC, thank you for your address today. I wanted to ask you about. Australia and its involvement in foreign conflict, given how much you had to say on that today. And you decried Australia's involvement in foreign conflicts and said there's no glory in dying for a nation or, or defending foreign empires. You yourself, on many an occasion, have also called for greater compassion for refugees and have seen firsthand what war and depravity can do to people fleeing Syria. So my question is, whilst with any conflict and any war, there is politics, there is militarism, there's self-interest. There can also be ideals behind them. Do you see no role for Australia to actively seek to save lives or to at least limit depravity? Or is the compassion of Australia to be limited to passively receiving refugees who may have the ability to flee? Um, I'm not a pacifist. Um, there are occasions when um, you are faced with the appalling decision of having to go to war to defend yourself, but it should be to defend yourself. And other than that, um, we should not send our children off to be part of the obscenity that is war. Um, war demands that those who go away either are killed or that they commit acts which in any other sphere of life um, they would be sentenced to prison for a very long time. It demands they become killers. And it's um, why anyone is recurrently surprised after each war that um, soldiers return with so much trauma that we expect them to be killers and then when they come back we expect them to be um, normal members of society. It, it is a terrible thing to do to any human being and our leaders should only do it in the last extreme. I think it is the greatest responsibility a politician can have, and I don't feel that um, I don't. I, you know, when I hear our leaders talk about, as they were with Iraq and Afghanistan, staying the course, seeing the mission through, the question had to be asked: what course, what mission? Because it was never explained to us. Um, and there very there should have been um, at least parliamentary debates on this, which are largely absent in our country. We we have the our country has the amazing spectacle, um, which went largely uncommented on here, of things like, uh, or people like Kim Beasley when he was leader of the opposition in 2005, according to a leaked cable and WikiLeaks, saying to the Amer then American ambassador that were it to come to war with China, Australia would be there behind America. What gives any politician the right to say, um, behind our backs, that we are to go and die for the American empire and their fight with another empire. It, 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 it beggars belief. So I, I think um, 
uh, lamentably because of what we are as human beings, we need um, a military capacity um, and there are times when we will have to use it but it should only be used in the last extreme. And uh, the history of Australia is that it has been cavalier in its foreign policy and at, uh, in Vietnam, in Iraq, we asked the Americans could we go in before the Americans asked us. I find that extraordinary. Mark Kenny has our next question. Mark Kenny, uh, Richard from uh, Fairfax Media. Uh, can I take you to an earlier part of your speech when you talked about uh, the rise of populism and uh, sort of right-wing demagogues? Do you think the left, um, broadly conceived, made up of uh, people such as yourself, uh, educated people, um, uh, artists, uh, people generally concerned with uh, this decline at the moment, this rising populism, has the left, in a sense, become the new conservative force, the protectors of institutional uh, institutional structures and conventions, um, as all of this phrase? Is there a role that can be played there uh, by the left, and is it doing it well enough? Um, well, that's a, an interesting observation, but I should say I don't see myself as being um, on the left. I'm not a member of any organisation or party and never have been. Um, I, I think what we're seeing more generally um, around the world is that there, for a hundred years, if you want to change whether you're on the right or left, you turn to politics. And whether you were on the right or the left, there was this belief that politics was the mechanism for change. And then with the collapse of communism, um, politics ceded its control and the idea of its own agency to the market. And we've gone a very long way down the idea that the market is the only force for change. And now we don't know how to get power back over our own destiny as individuals, as communities, as nations. And uh, so there is an enormous crisis. And I don't think um, the, the, no one has the answer, but it, I, I think what you do see is all those old categories of left and right becoming largely meaningless. You see it in Trump, who has positions that are both of the left and of the right, but who is uh, uh, utterly monstrous. And Sarah Martin has our next inquiry. Sarah Martin from the West Australian, thank you very much for your speech. Just following up from Mel's question, um, you talk about um, failing regimes, rising authoritarianism and few saviours of democracy. Um, many would argue that Australia's uh, military decisions, particularly um, in the Pacific and its increased sort of uh, defence build up in, in the Pacific with our allies, is, is aimed at um, countering those alternatives to democracy, such as China's you know, one party state authoritarianism. Um, of course, China wants to export that model to other countries in our region and further abroad. I is there not a risk in your criticism outlined today that you feed that contempt for democracy, however flawed that system may be, and give succour to those who are advocating other political systems that may be worse for their citizen citizenry? Um, and do you see any good in our democracy at the moment? Um, just. Uh, uh, I'm slightly lost. How, how, do I, how does my argument show a contempt for democracy? Well, I think um, you were very critical of, of uh, our democratic system as, as you see it at the moment. I'm not critical of our democratic system. I'm critical of the people who are the present incumbents and their failure to manifest um, any sense of responsibility towards this society. Um, it is they who don't believe in democracy. It is they who are not assuming their responsibilities as leaders. Um, it is they who are not finding ways of either addressing our problems or looking at the problems that are coming, and they're coming very rapidly at us. Um, and I think uh, it is, if you believe in democracy, you will mount those criticisms. Uh, so I, I, don't, I don't see that that's an anti-democratic position. Does that, uh, there was more to your question. I got a little bit. There were a lot of questions there. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I guess uh, the, the, it was a, a fairly negative appraisal of how you see the Australian democratic system at the moment. And um, given 
young people particularly have um, a little faith in democracy. A lot of you know, Lowy Institute, for example, has found that Australians uh, are losing faith in, this, in, in the system as a whole. I guess my question yeah. is, um, should we not be more alarmed at the alternatives that, are the, that we're oh, seeing in yeah, other yeah, parts yeah, of the yeah, world? Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I think the alternative is, is terrifying. Um, but the, the, the dilemma is, is that the people who should be... My argument is, when you're offered something like the Uluru Statement, which is a chance to create a larger vision of the nation, a unifying vision, um, uh, why would you not seize it? You know, why would you not run with it? Because it helps bring us together. It offers a positive idea. It offers an idea that can take us forward. Um, it was immediately falsely caricatured as an attack on democracy as being an unrepresentative third body of um, parliament, a third house of parliament. It was just a nonsense, you know. So I, um, I, there is a huge problem of disengagement, but if you want to engage people, you've got to do your job as leaders, as our elected leaders, and start acting to bring people together. Uh, I mean, the politics of uh, the last, you know, really of the last 20 years has largely been a politics of fear, of division, um, uh, and of um, promulgating nightmares. That's the sort of politics that tends to succeed. To say those things is not at all to impugn the importance of democracy or its necessity. And a question from Catherine Murphy. Hi, Richard. Thank you very much for your speech. I want to just dwell for a moment with you in your dark undercurrents and think about what some of the antidotes might be. Uh, as a journalist, uh, I sort of consider my professional mission as a war against the great unreason, and my weapon of choice are facts. Uh, but increasingly, I find that audiences, consumers, politicians, society, are not interested in facts or science or evidence or what you might call truth. Uh, so in those situations where one senses that what people want at this point in time is confirmation bias rather than challenge, what do we do, Richard? Well, um, I think that's a very important question. I I must say I was very honoured to come here because I believe in journalism. I think more than ever journalism matters and although Australia's media organisations are you know, in a state of disarray, um, I've met so many good Australian journalists who simply try and as best they can report the truth as they see it. I think that matters enormously and it matters because what's under attack at the moment isn't individual facts, although they are under attack, it is the very notion of truth itself is under attack. What, when a politician lies in the morning and then um, contradicts his lie with another lie in the afternoon, what they're saying to you finally is that um, n no truth matters and the truth itself is unimportant. And if truth doesn't matter, all we're left with is opinion. And if all we're left with is opinion, the opinion that pr will prevail is the opinion of the most powerful and the most wealthy. And then we've gone to a very dark place. So I, I think uh, uh, reportage is um, enormously important. And um, I think I, I just so admire journalists um, like you who just try and get the story out because I do think for all that truth is under attack, for all that there are these attempts, um, to some extent successful to manipulate us uh, through social media, I still think people have an instinct for the truth. They have an appetite for the truth that is as real um, as their appetite for food or for um, love, and they know it when they hear it, and it has a power. Um, and uh, and when, if you can do your job with enough craft and enough courage, um, you, your reports end up being heard and they end up having an effect. And uh, lies are quick and the truth is slow, but the truth is also inexorable. It is the, it is the most... I, I'm left believing in very little, but I believe in freedom and I believe in truth. And I think both matter enormously. Mm -hmm.
Stewart has our next question. Thanks very much for, for one of the best speeches that I think we've heard this, here this year. Um, on a superficial level, as the son of an 8th Division veteran, to what extent do you think, I mean, in the mall in Washington, there's a, a, a museum for the Indigenous American people. To what extent do you think we will not grow up as a country until there is a similar museum or some sort of memorial uh, here that reflects and explores the role of Indigenous people in Australia? And secondly, on, on the superficial level, uh, w w to, to what extent do you think that our uh, urgent need to commemorate the, this um, uh, myth of Anzac Day, which when I was young I remember we were wondering when it would actually die out, w to what extent does that send a fissure down Australian society that actually separates us rather than in, unites us together with the, the genuine causes that we should have about democracy and, and um, uh, honesty and openness? Well, as I said, Anzac Day was a very important day um, in my family and it remains so. But I'm very fearful about the use that it's being put to and I, I spoke about it today because if people don't speak up about um, what they feel Anzac Day to be, um, it's going to be taken over by bigots, and uh, you know, it, 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 and suddenly their vision of it as a, a, a almost a death cult um, becomes our national idea of ourselves, and we're entrapped. We're sort of being verbaled by some far right wing commentators. I think it's uh, it's going to a frightening place, and it needs to be challenged very strongly. The history of Anzac Day, it wasn't big in the 20s and 30s at all uh, because Australia lived through those dead decades fully aware of the extraordinary cost that we'd paid um, for that war. Um, as you said, 50s and 60s, it was, uh, you know, it, had a, it was in bad odour. Essentially, I'm not that old. <laughs> uh, well, no, but I mean, essentially it was revived by Hawke um, and it's been um, pumped up and pumped up by state funding and um, if it has a place in the Australian um, psyche let it have that place but I'm disturbed when the state puts so much money into it and it militarises memory and we have to decide what, what, what are to be the stories, what is Australia and how, you know, I don't think it is uh, that story of um, all those young men being tragically slaughtered for the British Empire. I just think that's the, a terribly wrong story and it, it serves political ends but I think ultimately it could um, damage us greatly in our society. We are heading towards the end of proceedings but our next question is from Ken Randall. Uh, Richard, I'd like to take you back to the question of myths and national identity. I remember um, Hugh McKay in one of his books a few years ago wrote that uh, uh, the term un-Australian simply means somebody that doesn't agree with you. And he said there were no distinctive Australian characteristics. Do you see any? Um, well, no, I think human beings are human beings and it's very dangerous to indulge in the idea that there's any specific traits. But um, you, you, you are presented with choices about what you celebrate and what you honour and that shapes the temper of a society and, um, and then the acts of a society. And I think if we were to see ourselves as being the heirs of a 60,000-year-old civilisation and we were to honour that properly, I think that is a very... Um, a, a story pregnant with great hope for us as a nation. Um, and I think some of the other stories, um, as I said earlier, um, will have the opposite effect and can be used for chilling purposes. So, no, the, the ultimately, you know, I don't think there are national traits. They're just human traits. Within each of us is a capacity for the, the greatest evil and the greatest good. But we have to find reasons to live together as a community. We need stories. And I think um, we, we are presently choosing the wrong ones. And a last question today from Jenny Bott. Thank you. 
Richard, thank you very, very much for that amazing talk. It was a real privilege to listen to it. I wanted to ask you a question, though, as a, as a writer. Um, about 15 years ago, everybody was inaccurately predicting that book sales were declining and, uh, you know, it was the end, the end of the book. And, of course, here we are now with book sales are up, uh, writers' festivals are burgeoning all over the country. What do you think is happening there? What is that about? Well, I think two things have happened. One, I think, as the other spaces for public debate and discussion have closed down, as politics has become closed off from people, as the media has um, started to collapse, um, books have returned as a place where people can discuss many of the things that concern them. The other thing that books have an enormous uh, power is the way that um, they're not dependent on uh, money or corporate power to be made. I mean, all that stands between a writer and a great book is their own lack of talent. Um, <laughs> that's it. And uh, if they can, they can do the job, if they do the job well enough, uh, they're heard. And so, um, and you see that again and again. And I think finally, um, books, in, in a time when the razor wire has been run around the world and everything is telling us uh, about what divides us from another and each other, books remind us of one great truth, that we're never alone and that we're joined to others. And if, if for no other reason, I think that is a, uh, the justification for literature. What a terrific note on which to end. Would you please thank Richard Flanagan? Thank you. Um, we, always, we always give a little something to our guest speakers, so here's membership of the Press Club to come back and have a drink uh, whenever you're next in Canberra. And it's always intimidating to give a book to a writer of um, such preeminence, but it's by one of Australia's other greatest, finest writers, Steve Lewis, uh, <laughs> recording some of the great speeches that have been given here at the club. So uh, thank you very much. Well, thank Enjoy. you, Alicia. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you.